start, and I'm very pleased to have you here. My name is Bill Gibbs. I'll be the host for the session today. By the way, the session is being recorded, and we will make available to you, uh, to our guests, uh, a uh, link to the recording later this afternoon, as well as um, all of the slides. Now, today our presentation is by Bernard White and uh, Wright, excuse me, and it's tips for future career success in technology. I've been looking over the slides and I'm very excited about this session because I think that it has valuable tips, not only for someone new in their career, but just valuable tips, period, for anybody at any stage in their career. Now, let's talk about the agenda that we'll be following today. Uh, first, we're gonna learn just a little bit about capital. Then I'll go over the housekeeping, the session pointers. I'll introduce the presenter, and I also have a very brief interview with the presenter before we begin. Then you'll hear your presentation, uh, the presentation by Mr. W uh, Wright, uh, followed by a Q&A time. And then um, a little bit about our last webinar of the academic year, the one that will be held next month in June. I think you'll be very excited about that. And finally, uh, we'll wrap up by talking about how to get a copy of the recording, the slides, and a certificate of participation. I know from looking at the audience members today that some of you have been in every webinar that we've ever produced and you've heard some of the same material before. I know that some of you are students and some of you are faculty and staff, but I welcome each one of you. And I always think it's good and refreshing to go back a little bit into history and talk about our institution. Uh, very few people realize just how long we have been in existence since 1927, which means here in just a, in, in five short years, we will be celebrating our centennial, our 100th anniversary. We're one of the very few private universities in the state of Maryland, and really I should mention really anywhere in the country that is specifically de dedicated to STEM, uh, engineering, cybersecurity, computer sciences, and the management of technology and technological people. Uh, we have a glorious history that spans back many, many years and uh, we're very pleased to continue our heritage and expand it as we go. Uh, we're a nonprofit, private, and accredited. Each one of those are key words, but I don't want to spend too much time on them, but I do want to mention that uh, that red, the word in red, the accredited word, um, sometimes uh, people get a little confused about what accreditation means, and in educational circles in the United States, accreditation means everything. It is the certification that the university has met all of the requirements and standards to operate at the highest levels. We're accredited by the Middle States Commission on Higher Education uh, and uh, its regional accreditation, which in the United States is the highest form of accreditation available to any college or university. We're also authorized by the state of Maryland to confer degrees all the way from two-year associate's degrees right up to our doctoral degrees, our Doctor of Business Administration, our Doctor of Science, and our PhD degrees. Just a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll get uh, into introducing the presenter. We'll answer questions at the conclusion of the presentation, but you can enter them at any time you want into the text chat and we'll be watching for them and we will answer just as many as we have time to do. Uh, we will be together a little bit less than an hour and so we'll take as many questions as we can during that time. Uh, we're not activating microphones or webcams for any participant today in this webinar. Uh, as I mentioned several times, we'll be sending a link to the recording and to the slides and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the presentation. We also offer uh, certif uh, certificates, excuse me, can't get my words out. A participation certificate is available upon request and I'll talk about that at the end of the webinar as well. Well, in a little bit, we're going to hear uh, directly from our speaker, Bernard Wright, on tips for future career ses, uh, success in technology. I want to first introduce him with his official bio, and then I am going to conduct a very brief interview with him. Uh, let me begin by getting to the bio. Uh, Bernard Wright is an esteemed member of the Board of Directors of Capital Technology University. He's also president of Wave Welcome, and in that role, partners with organizations to provide leadership and strategic direction for key corporate initiatives. 
His professional IT experience is comprised of multiple, multiple senior leadership roles, which have included serving as CIO VP of Operations for Iron Bow Technology, CIO for the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission, otherwise known as the WSSC Water, CIO for Prince George's County Government, and this is interesting, Director of Technology for Hillary Clinton during her successful United States Senate re-election campaign and her subsequent 2008 presidential campaign. Uh, in addition to more than two decades of IT experience, Bernard brings an equal amount of hands-on experience in working with young people through myriad avenues. His experience includes mentoring students in multiple settings, as a Roadrunners Coach of America and a USA Track and Field Certified Coach, he has coached many young athletes into NCAA scholarships. Now, before we begin the presentation, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Wright to go ahead and activate his mic and, and um, camera, and I'm going to just ask him a few questions. Uh, Bernard, it sounds like you've done a lot of running or otherwise <laughs> track and field in other ways. How did you get involved in athletics and co coaching athletes? I appreciate the question, Bill, and I, and I apologize. Um, I'm not seeing the option to uh, come back on video, but um, not that the participants are missing much there. Uh, but in terms of how I actually got into coaching, um, it was more of a utility for me because I do have four children who I wanted to make sure we found a sport that they could each participate in. And that did work out well for me. Um, so from there, I just found out that they really were good at track and that it was something that they were going to succeed at. Uh, so to the point where my youngest daughter is now a freshman while a rising sophomore running track at University of Maryland. Uh, so I was a former athlete myself, but I since gave that up once I realized uh, that I wasn't going to be competitive anymore. So I just focus on being more of a technologist now. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I'm not sure why your video is not working either. It had been working earlier, so uh, we will not uh, be graced with your presence. I can see your picture, but uh, so hopefully it'll come back on. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, here's a second question for you. In your current role with Wave Welcome, what do you see as some of the great challenges that the IT industry is facing right now? I appreciate that question, Bill. It's a great question. So one of the things I've seen is that organizations of different sizes across multiple industries tackle a lot of the same challenges. And those challenges tend to be based around uh, what to do with the technology that really is burgeoning across the board. Um, so as the technology accelerates, the question becomes whether to invest in those new technologies or to stay where you are. Um, so that is where we do engage just to make sure that we're putting together a cost benefit analysis to see whether you can achieve the same things by simply doing things differently as opposed to spending new money on technology. Um, in addition to that, there really is, and I'm pretty sure everyone has heard about some of the more high profile cybersecurity incidents, whether it's a ransomware attack or a data breach. Uh, so cybersecurity really is a huge consideration for a lot of different people. And certainly there are lots of opportunities, but lots of things to focus on there as well. Uh, also, just in light of where we've gone over the past couple of years with COVID, we really have accelerated in terms of our move to the cloud. Uh, so because we are working from everywhere, because we are returning to the office, but also still working remotely, that has facilitated a migration to the cloud. So a lot of people are hosting their workloads in the cloud and that it gives them that gives them the ability to be able to do the same things remotely as they can in person. So that is another one. Uh, but the last I, I'd like to touch on really is around data. Uh, because we do have so many devices that are connected to the internet, because we have so many different things that are generating data, uh, a big challenge for organizations is number one, understanding where their data resides, but then also making sense of that data. Um, so there are going to be billions of different devices that over time will be connected, uh, but those devices are each generating a certain workload of data. Um, so I had a very interesting 
meeting this morning with NASA and they're talking about the satellites and telescopes that they're deploying to outer space and the amount of data those are generating, um, terabytes of data every day. Um, so there are lots of organizations like that that have to account for the proliferation of data, where that's going to reside and how they secure that data. Well, thank you very much. That's very interesting. Uh, I was thinking back, I'm not gonna digress from your presentation back, back in the day when it was actually possible to carry all the data from one computer to the other on a, on a portable hard drive. Uh, but when you're talking about terabytes of data being produced every single day, um, methods of getting that information have to be conveyed. Well, let's get on to the presentation. It's not about me at all. So we want to talk about tips for future success in technology. And I introduce to you, Bernard Wright. Go ahead and take it away. And thank you, Bill. Uh, and good morning to everyone who's not in the Eastern time zone. And good afternoon, good afternoon to those who are. Um, so I am going to, as Bill shared, talk about different ways that people can be successful into, in getting into the careers that they're pursuing. Um, and this is going to be from the perspective of not just someone who has applied for jobs in the past and gotten those jobs, but also from the perspective of a person who has hired lots of people. Um, and these tips are time proven. They've worked for me. I've gotten these from other people as well. So can't take complete credit because it really is a combination of different things that I'm put, I put into these slides. So I'm looking forward to sharing this information with you. So as you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to type those into the chat because I'm looking forward to answering those questions and interacting with you as much as possible. So this first quote I, I do like uh, because it really is a reminder that we all have power inside of us that is waiting to be tapped into. And it's really a matter of us understanding ourselves and realizing what our potential is. Um, so that really is where I start personally in terms of my success, but also something I try to encourage. Uh, so one of the things I do, and Bill was asking earlier about mentors and mentees, I do make sure that that is a big part of who I am. Um, and one of the things I do encourage is that people understand who they are. And part of understanding who you are is understanding the inherent power that each one of us possesses. So what we're going to talk about today is not just the technical skills, but I really like to drill down a little more into the soft skills. Uh, so the differentiation between the two is the technical skills are how well you code, how you are a database administrator or whatever, profession you've gone into. The soft skills tend to be those other things that can either serve as benefits or impediments. Uh, so those could be things, I gave a few examples here. The, your ability to be able to communicate effectively, your ability to be able to connect with the people that you're speaking with, how professional you are, the connection that you make with people. So those are different things that can really help you in your search. So what I've done here is I've put together a list of 10 different things that I consider to be my cheat code for being effective in pursuing a job. And these are things that I've also posted out to LinkedIn. I am very active on LinkedIn, which is another tip that you can use for potential job opportunities. Uh, some people have success there, others don't, but there are multiple platforms where you can network and reach out to prospective employers. So the first is to make sure that you're not just blanket sending out resumes and applications. So identify the types of jobs that you want to pursue and make sure that your application is very specific to that, to that particular opportunity. That might mean rewriting your resume in some cases. It might mean making sure that you're paying attention to keywords and making sure there's a map to your resume because oftentimes what happens is there are automated tools that are going through and filtering out resumes. So if your keywords don't match what's necessarily in the job description, you won't even make it to an interview. So just make sure that you're paying close attention to that and making sure that your application materials are specific to the, to the job that you're pursuing. The next, and this is something that I found as an employer, I'm very impressed by people who know about the organization. 
and not just the obvious things that are in the about us page on your website, but also knowing what specific in terms of pain points. So what would you contribute if you came in? How would you help the organization? But also one of the things that also resonates with an, with an interview panel is that you know the members of the interview panel and possibly some personal things about them as well. It does indicate that you're very serious about the organization, but that you're willing to take the time and do research to learn a little bit more. And that really leads into tip number three, which is developing a 100 day plan. So I've used this successfully multiple times when I was pursuing jobs as a CIO. And what I would do here is really anticipate for the first few months, if I was successful in getting the job, what I would do to move the organization forward. Uh, so that I would start off at the very beginning, uh, just reiterating what the strategic objectives of the organization were and how my position as I understood it would map to those strategic objectives. And then from there, talk about what I would do in the first couple of weeks to make sure that I was going in to understand the organization. And that's both internally, externally, and the people that they interface with, like their partners and vendors. And from there, really laying out a roadmap for improving the organization. So I would encourage you to do the same. And that really is going to lead into a tip that I'm gonna to touch on a little bit later. So the next one, tip number four, is just in case you're with an interview panel that doesn't have your resume handy, make sure that you have extra copies of your resume so that you can hand those over so that as you're speaking through your experience and how that maps to the organization, they can follow along and see how your career has progressed. The next, and this is really important, not just from the organization's perspective that you're interviewing with, but also your perspective as well. You do wanna make sure that your personality is apparent to the interview panel. You want to make sure it's a great fit, not just for the organization, but for you as well. Uh, many times as we go into a new job, we find that maybe it's not the organization we want to be a part of. So it is important up front to make sure that you're understanding what the organization is, but that also they're understanding who you are as a person. And I'll touch on this one a little later in the slides as well. So number six is a very interesting one. So especially as an employer, you do have a pretty good feel for what some of the typical interview questions are. Uh, so a lot of those could range from, so what are your shortcomings? What is it you need to work on? Uh, how are you going to continue learning? Um, those are questions that are pretty standard. So make sure you write out a list of potential interview questions. And what that does is help you to think through what the potential answers to those questions could be so that you don't get stuck as you're going through the interview. Next, number seven is to make sure you talk about what makes you different from other people that are interviewing for the position. So what are your differentiators? How are you better than the competition? And let's be clear, this really is a competition. So why should the company or organization hire you? Number eight really maps back to number three. So leave behinds could be your resume, it could be your 100 day plan, it could be your cost benefit analysis. So if you're hired, how are you going to benefit the organization? But whatever that is, make sure you leave something behind so that they can always go back and take a look at why they should hire you later after the interview, uh, after the interview concludes. So number nine is to make sure after the interview has concluded, send an email to the panelists later. Just say, hey, thank you for the interview. I'm really excited about your organization and I'd love to join and here's how I could benefit. So just reiterate a lot of the points that you made during the interview. That also serves as a reminder that you'd be a great fit for that organization. And last but not least, once you get the position, once you get the position, be prepared to come in on day one and deliver. So it starts with day one, but continually make sure that you're very focused on how you're going to move the organization forward. And one thing I do try to emphasize with the people that I do mentor is leaders are at all levels of the organization. It's not just team leads, it's not just managers, it's not just the C-suite. Everyone can be a leader in an organization. So certainly make sure that you're focused on that from day one. So I'm going to drill down into these a little bit more in the subsequent slides. So what I've done is I've put together 10 different tips 
that really give a little bit more information about how you can make sure you're effective in the interview and then once you get the job. So number one, and this is especially now that we're moving toward a global society, which I'll talk about in a bit, don't make sure you understand that this can be in some cases, especially as you become more senior, a very arduous process. Sometimes you might have to submit dozens of resumes. I've even heard instances where people submit hundreds of resumes before they find the right position. So don't underestimate that. Make sure you set aside the time, make sure that you're very diligent about applying and make sure that you are making sure your application materials are well aligned with the position as it's advertised. And the last tip that's a part of, well, the sub tip that's a part of tip one is I've found from personal experience, it's a lot of times easier to do this if you already have a job. So perhaps the job you're on today is not a good fit, but that's a good time because you're not having to compromise as much as you would otherwise based on money. So tip number two, I touched on this slightly earlier. Um, there was certainly a time where before the internet and even when the internet was new, you were just competing regionally. Then as time went on, you were competing nationally, but certainly now, and especially because so many people are working remotely, your competition is across the globe. So I said before that job searches are certainly a competition. Well, life is a competition. And that is certainly the case when you're looking for a job. So remember, there could be someone out there who maybe has greater pedigree um, with their degrees. I mean, certainly Capital Technology University does a great job of rolling out PhDs. You might be up against a PhD and you have a bachelor's, but certainly you can make the case that because of your experience, that is on par, that puts you on par with a PhD. But whatever that is, whatever it is that makes you resonate or that makes, sets you apart, make sure you emphasize those. So in your application materials, make sure you highlight what your strengths are, but also during the interview, make sure you do the same. So the next, emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is really how you connect with others. Uh, that means taking nonverbal cues and just make sure that you're aware of your surroundings. And certainly that's the case during the interview. Make sure you're paying attention to the interview panel and whether you're connecting with them. Are they nodding their head? Are they smiling? So those are things that can really help you out with your interview. And especially if you're talking too long, you might see them zone out. You might even see them pick up their smartphone or do something else. Just make sure you pay attention to those cues and try as much as possible to connect with the interview panel. So certainly be aware and double down on those things that you find you're doing well. So if there's a certain point that really seems to resonate, maybe you wanna expound on that. If you're turning, if you find that you're turning an interview panel off, Perhaps it's time to switch gears and go to something else. So tip number four, assume that the interview panel has done research on you. Assume that they've gone out and, and done a Google search. And certainly if those questions come up, if there's something that might be questionable, be prepared to speak to it. But if they haven't done research, make sure that you talk about what your personal brand is. And we'll touch on this a bit later, but make sure that you don't overshare. And I'll talk about that. Um, certainly, there are some things that you might share during the interview that could, if you're in a good position, maybe nix your chances at that job. So just make sure you're using discretion when you're sharing during the interview. Tip number five, and then just touch on this a bit, make sure you do answer the questions fully. And certainly it does help if you anticipate what those questions are, but make sure that as you're talking, don't share too much information, especially if that information is going to disqualify you. So make sure you're speaking to your experience. And certainly as those questions are being asked, one thing that I found works well is don't just answer the question theoretically, meaning what you would do, but it certainly helps to say how you've done that in the past before. So if someone asked you a question, say, that's a great question. Here's what I would do, but also, in the past, I've run into that situation before and here's how I resolved it. Tip number six, and this goes to making sure that people understand exactly who you are as a person. 
uh, certainly talk about your volunteer activities because it's a part of, part of who you are. And make sure that you are talking specifically about the things that you like to do outside of work, especially if those things are complementary of the organization you're going to be joining. Uh, so examples of this, and this is a part of my bio, as you saw that Bill shared earlier, I always made sure during my career, everyone I was working with knew that I was a track coach. It was very important that they understood that at a certain time, hey, um, I might have to leave out for track practice, I might have to go to track meets, but I'll certainly make sure I get the work done. But certainly uh, coaching track for me is a philanthropic uh, opportunity. It's an activity that's very important to me. Um, it's part of what makes me tick. And each one of us has those things that really help us to recharge. And certainly you wanna make sure you're talking about those things because I would consider those to be strengths. Tip number seven, and this is very critical for me. Um, this is a question that I tend to ask uh, during my interviews is, once you get this job, what are you going to do to continue learning? Uh, so something I try to emphasize with my team members is personal accountability. So what I've done in the past is I've built into my organizations what's called an individual development plan. Certainly it's our job as employers, as leaders, as managers to promote our people to make sure they're growing, but a certain part of that is on the individual as well. So as you come in and eventually you wanna go from being a frontline worker to being a manager, to being a team lead, uh, what is it that you're going to do in order to make sure you're moving along? What courses are you going to take? What conferences are you going to go to? What articles are you going to read? Uh, so how is it that you're going to continue learning? So please be prepared to speak to that because it could be an interview question. Make sure that you view this as lifelong learning, not just to get the job. Tip number eight, and this is very important. I've run up against this in the past, both, both as an employer, but also as a prospective employee. It's critical to know what the salary range is. Oftentimes, if you ask directly, okay, what's the salary range? They'll tell you. And that way you know whether it's something that's a good fit for you. Certainly as you move along in your career and your salary increases, it's helpful to know up front whether or not your potential employer can even afford you. Is it going to be a step down for you if money is important? Um, that's certainly something you'd wanna know up front. And as you get the job and your pay starts to come in, something I also emphasize with my mentees is to make sure you know what to do with your money. Uh, it's very important to not always make decisions based on money, uh, but that certainly helps if you're spending your money wisely. So for example, I do have some interns that are starting with me on Monday. And one of the things they're gonna be doing on day one is building out a budget. So once you get your first paycheck, what are you going to do with it? And as you move along, having a budget up front and being smart with your money certainly helps you to make decisions that are not solely based on money because you've been wise with it. Tip number, one, tip number nine, and this is, it used to be the case that managers were the ones who were working the long hours and burning the midnight oil. But now, especially since so many people have been working from home, we're working in the, we're working long hours and the lines between your personal and professional life are blurred. So as you get to the point where you are burned out and it is important to recognize the signs of burned out, what are you going to do to recharge? What are you going to do to head off your burnout? Uh, so what are the things that help you to get back to where you need to be? Is it exercise? Is it meditation? Is it prayer? Um, is it going to the beach? Is it going to a restaurant? I mean, those things that really help you to get back to center are going to be very critical for making sure that you're still an effective employee. Uh, so just make sure, like I said, number one is to recognize the signs of burnout, try to avoid burnout, certainly. But as you realize that, hey, I might need to take a break, figure out what you need to do in order to be able to recharge. Uh, so certainly it's good to be a, an effective employee, but part of being an effective employee is making sure that you're doing the things that are necessary for you to continue being productive. And tip number 10, as you move along in your career, especially with the proliferation of so much information online, it's critical that you protect your legacy. What will people say about you? If you 
if someone were to reach out to your former employers, what would they say about you as a worker? Uh, what contributions did you leave to, with your organization? What are you doing outside of work? Those are all things that really contribute to your legacy. So make sure that you're very deliberate with that. It takes years to build up your reputation, but it takes one bad move to tear it down. So make sure you're very careful. Make sure that you're always aware as much as possible what others think of you. And a good way to be able to do that is simply asking. So as a leader, I've done this multiple times. I've done something called a reverse appraisal or at least 360 review, where I go out and I ask people, including my, the people who reported to me directly, what could I do better as a leader? I ask people at the same level in the organization, is there something I can do differently? But also the people that I report to proactively, hey, is there something I can improve on? And that really is critical to make sure that you're understanding what your reputation is, and in position to make adjustments. So what I've done here is I've thrown in a few more tips. Those were 10 tips that I just shared that have served me well and certainly have served uh, others well that I've hired in the past. But these are some things that help you to be successful once you've landed the job. So these are really around the people that you report to, your supervisor, um, some might say your boss. I found that it really is critical for me to keep my supervisor fully informed. One of the things that can get you in trouble with an organization is if something comes up and they're not aware of it. So not just through status reports, but just as a heads up, if something is going off the rails a bit, reach out to your supervisor and say, hey, here's what's going on, but not just here's what's going on, what am I going to do to fix it? So while I was working with Prince George's County as the chief information officer, I had a supervisor who was one of my favorite supervisors who would say, don't just come to me with a problem, but come with a solution. So certainly I'd make sure he was informed about what was going on. And part of being informed was also what I planned to do to fix whatever challenge was facing me. So that's a great tip that I would give you. Certainly make sure that people understand what's going on, that they have situational awareness, and that does serve you well. The next is, and this is something I found as well, if your supervisor has to do your job, they might not need you. So make sure you're understanding, number one, what your role is, and make sure that you're doing everything that you should be doing with that role, so that it's never a question of the value that you're bringing to your organization. And the last on this slide is, because they hired you, they did think you were a good fit. So you're starting from a, a very good point on day one and you can either improve or you can get worse off. And by being worse off, what that means is that you gradually degrade in the eyes of your organization. And unfortunately that can mean being written up, being disciplined or even losing that job. So make sure that you understand, number one, you are starting from a very good point because the organization is very excited about you joining and do whatever it takes in order to stay in a good position with that organization. So because you are part of this webinar, my assumption, my personal assumption is that you are very focused on your value. You are curious about what can make you more successful in your, in your pursuit of a job. And for those mentors who are here, what tips can you give to your mentees? How can you help them to be more successful? So each one of us does have inherent greatness in us. Going back to the quote that I shared before, we each have power uh, that we need to tap into. And we'd all be so much better off if we understood just how great we are. So number one, make sure you do understand who you are, but make sure you're tapping into that. So with that being said, I'd like to open it up for any questions. And certainly if you don't want to share the questions here, here's my contact information. I'd welcome the opportunity to speak with as many of you as possible. All right, well, thank you very much. I uh, felt like bursting into climb every mountain right there in that last slide is uh, because of uh, the path to greatness. That's an amazing line. I like that a lot. Uh, let's open the floor to questions now. 
And uh, several comments have come in. I'm not sure I would qualify them as questions or not, but there is a question. Uh, George, I'm going to come back to your question on computer language um, in just a little bit. I won't forget it. Uh, George mentions several times I've interviewed with a half a dozen interviewers at a single session. When you have a large group of interviewers, a panel as it were, um, Bernard, what what is a good way to make sure that you uh, give them each the, the time that they deserve for that interview? Well, certainly um, if you're able to research that interview panel up front, that does help, but that's not always a possibility. Uh, so certainly if you do have a large interview panel, make sure that you're trying to speak to everyone who's in the room because everyone is there for a reason. Uh, so in the past, and certainly what comes to mind is when I was CIO for WSC Water, I used to bring in multiple managers who would be interacting with whatever role I was hiring for at that point. So a good way, and I would try to take the onus off the person who was being interviewed and make sure that we were rotating through the questions so that the interviewee was having a, a, an opportunity to speak with each person who was a part of the panel. But that also helped to make sure that they were getting a feel for what that person's style was. But if that's not the case and if one person is asking the question, it certainly helps to look around the room and try to make those direct connections with the people who are a part of the room and also to pick up on those verbal cues, those nonverbal cues that I talked about before. So is the person nodding their head? Is there a person who seems to be tuned out? Um, as much as possible, try to connect with as many people in the room as possible. And certainly I know it's overwhelming when you do have a large panel um, of six or um, even larger uh, panels in some cases, but certainly, try to make sure that you're connecting with as many people in the room as possible. And just understand that that is becoming the norm more and more. And what makes it even more difficult is when it's a panel interview across video, which makes it even more difficult to pick up those nonverbal cues. But certainly once you see who's a part of that interview panel, you can address the people by name directly and that helps to make a connection. But as much as possible, when you do have those panels, it's critical to make sure that you're connecting with them directly. You know, I was just thinking about what you were saying, because uh, often uh, in the technology world, particularly the one that you have been in, um, those people in IT roles will actually communicate and work with people from across the entire spectrum of the company, because they're dealing with data that covers everybody. Um, and so starting at the very beginning in the interview stage to really get to know people would be a boon, uh, would be a help. You're absolutely um, right. You're absolutely right, Bill. Um, so I can, I'm thinking back to an interview that I had. It was an eight hour interview. And for that reason, like you said, it was people from across the organization and understandably so because I was coming in as CIO, uh, which is a part of the executive team for most organizations. Uh, so I interviewed with five different people in the organization. And the last interview was with the CEO himself. So I had to make sure that number one, I was fortunate enough to be able to know who those interview, who the interview panel members were going to be. And I made sure that I spoke directly to each one of them and said what I would do to help that part of the organization out. So certainly that did benefit me well. And another opportunity, uh, well, another example I'd like to give is when I was interviewing to be director of technology for Hillary Clinton. Uh, so that was five different interviews. And the fifth interview was with Hillary Clinton. Uh, so that gave me the ability to go back and prepare for the next round. And certainly as you move along in your career and for some larger organizations that are a little more formal in their interview processes, that could be the case where you start off and they're really just screening you to see whether or not you're a good fit to go to the next round of interviews. And as you go along, you have to prepare for the next round and if you're fortunate, you'll know who that next round is going to be with, but certainly make sure that you're preparing as much as possible. Very good points. Uh, George brings up an interesting comment. He says, one of the best advice I was uh, ever given by one of my mentors was to attend corporate events as often as possible and to buy pizzas occasionally. Oh. Um, and, um, the pizza part aside, I, I see what it, where he's going with that, but uh, 
weigh in a little bit about the importance of, of uh, being involved in, in company activities. Absolutely. And I mean, if, if, if George brought in pizza for me, I think he'd be a winner. <laughs> He's that kind of person, I suspect, yes. Um, speaking of that, we're gonna, uh, I'm going to change gears to make sure because I promised that I would answer this question. George says, uh, this was from early on in your introduction. He said, are there a few computer languages to learn for SCADA? Mm -hmm. I might have mispronounced that. SCADA yep. set firmware. Most industrial utilities do not use web-based languages such as PHP, et cetera. That's right. Yeah. So it's SCADA. Um, so SCADA, SCADA. Thank you. And, and George is correct. I do see that comment. A lot of um, SCADA networks. Um, so SCADA networks, for those who aren't familiar with the term, tend to be used by utilities such as water utilities, um, electric utilities. And those are separate networks that are outside of the data networks that really control your computers or your telephone systems. And because they are separate networks that control the utilities, a lot of times those are not directly connected to the internet and for good reason. So there were some very um, notable examples like uh, Stuxnet is an example that comes to mind where it was, a, it was malware that impacted an electric utility and proliferated throughout the world. Um, and they thought that because they were air gap, which means they were not connected to the internet, that they were immune from being affected by malware. Um, so that's the reason why a lot of those networks are not connected to the internet, because if, you're, if you get into a state of network, you can really impact an organization in a major way. Um, so just imagine with a water utility, and this just certainly happened, where a person gets onto the network and they can cut off the flow of water. They can distribute chemicals um, in a way that should not happen. So that's one of the biggest reasons why web-based languages such as PHP are not used. Um, so depending on the age of the SCADA network, it could be something older like C or C sharp, um, but certainly uh, more and more, you are seeing newer languages be used. Um, so it could be Java, it could be .NET, uh, but it just varies depending on the organization and how long that SCADA network has been around, uh, what languages are used. Thank you. You're I'm welcome. looking at this question, so I don't see any more. I'm going to give everybody one more opportunity. Aha, Camille just popped in with one, as did uh, PXLE. So let's start with Camille's question. It says, if applying for a stretch position, how much would you mention uh, I'm not sure, Camille, I follow this completely. Mm -hmm. uh, can you see the question, Bernard? I can. I, I can. Uh, and, yeah, it, and I appreciate that question, Camille. So the question is, if applying for a stretch position, how much would the mention of an, inten of an intended individual development plan or continuous learning plan help a candidate in an interview? Okay, so now I understand the question at least. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh, no, no problem. Um, so what I'm going to do here is put myself in the position of being the person who's hiring. Um, so certainly seeing that this person took the initiative to talk about what they're going to do to continue learning, that would, that for me would be a positive uh, because you're saying, okay, well, here's how I'm going to make sure I continue being effective in this position, not just as it exists today, but how, here's how I'm going to continue to grow. So if you came in and you talked about, here's how I'm going to make sure that over time, and especially if you have milestones for measurement, saying, okay, I wanna make sure that in six months I get this certification. A year from now, I get this certification. That shows initiative. So I think that it that would be a plus. And especially at the end of an interview when the question tends to be, do you have anything else you'd like to share? Do you have any questions for us? That's certainly a great place for you to jump in and say, here's what I would do specifically if I were successful getting this job to show that I am willing to continue learning. Here's the individual development plan I've put together for this organization. So for me, that would be a winning proposition. That's a great answer. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question says, uh, let's see, the questions are really starting to come in now. So uh, uh, what advice would you give for a coding test uh, that is to write a software program during an interview? I get that a lot nowadays. Yeah, so it depends on the position. So certainly for some organizations or positions, that's going to be critical. Um, so 
what I've seen is that there are some people that interview very well, uh, but then they come in and they're not a great fit for various reasons. Could be related to the soft skills, but a lot of times it's simply because uh, technically maybe they overrepresented what's on their resume. And a great way to be able to screen that out is by doing a coding test. Um, so certainly uh, be prepared for that. So what didn't show up on my uh, bio is that I used to be a software developer. So this was quite a while ago. Um, so I used to work for a company called Digex, which was later acquired by WorldCom and then became Verizon. And while I was at Digex, I was actually a cold fusion developer. So for uh, the old timers on, on this webinar, you'll remember Cold Fusion, uh, but then I became a .NET developer. But the reason that's relevant is because during the interview, I actually did have to write a mini program in Cold Fusion to demonstrate that I understood the language. And that's what got me the job. So certainly it can help you to get the job if you do have the coding test, but it also helps the employer understand whether or not you're capable of coming in and hitting, hitting the ground running on day one. So um, depending on what the position is, those coding tests are critical. Um, so be prepared for those if you're in a more technical position. Thank you. You're Roy welcome. asks a very intriguing question. He says, what about references and maintaining contacts? Sure. Um, so what I found is most noteworthy with references is the more senior people in an organization. So uh, with each one of the organizations you're a part of, it does help to build those relationships with the people who are part of the ex executive team. Um, so that way, when you provide a reference, it's a senior person in the organization who can speak to your value. Uh, so the more senior a person in an organization, the more weight that reference carries. And certainly as you move along in your career, it does help to make sure that you're maintaining those relationships with people who you might want to use as a reference later. Um, so I would strongly encourage you to Number one, cultivate those relationships with the top levels of the organizations you're a part of, uh, but then also longer term, make sure they're a part of your network. And fortunately, we have tools like LinkedIn that allow us to do that fairly easily. So certainly, um, like I said, the biggest thing I want you to take away from that is the more senior your reference is, the more weight it carries. Uh, that makes complete sense to me. It just uh, reminded me of the young man who was applying for his first position and uh, was told to bring in his references. So to the interview, we brought his mother and his best friend. <laughs> um, but uh, that's an aside. Thomas asks this, if you lack uh, experience in a particular skill or technology, can you compensate by, tealing, by detailing how you will learn the skill? It's a little bit of a riff on the earlier question, but I think sure. it's a very good question. It is a great question. And what I'll say is that it depends. It depends on whether the skill that you're lacking is critical for the job. So if you're coming in as a Java developer and you don't know Java, um, that could be an issue. Uh, but if it's, a, if it's more of a peripheral skill where it's not the main thing that you'll be doing, certainly speaking to how you're gonna hit the ground running and learn in between the time that you finish the interview and, and starting the job, how you're gonna learn that skill or even during the first few weeks on the job, that could be acceptable. But like I said, it depends on the skill that you're lacking and um, certainly what it is that you're going to be doing longer term. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, just normally in the position description, they are calling out the skills that they're looking for. So make sure you're a good fit. That goes back to what I was saying before about tailoring your resume to the job, but make sure you're not embellishing to the point that you're saying you can do things that you're not so great at. I mean, there certainly is a the job out here that's perfect for each one of us, um, but make sure that the jobs that are critical for the skill, the jobs, I mean, the skills that are um, critical for a job are things that you do well. Um, and if it's something that's more, prefer, uh, that's more with, uh, on the wish list for an organization. So what I do when I put together a position description, I will say these are mandatory skills. But then I'll say, hey, these are things that are preferred. And then the last section is nice to have. So if it's something in it that's in the nice to have category, certainly you could speak to how you're going to, going to pick that skill up. But if it's something that is mandatory for a position, uh, it would probably be viewed as a, as a mark on your resume if you're not able to do that. That's a great answer. 
I think that's the last question for the moment. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the final portions of our webinar. I will note to everybody who's joined the call that if you do have a question that you just had planned to type into it, go ahead and do that. And uh, we still have a few more minutes, but I want to make sure that we cover the um, rest of our uh, uh, content here. Whoops, went ahead too fast. Let me get back to this. Let's talk a little bit about what's happening next month. On June 16th, we're, our final webinar of this academic year will be with Dr. Richard Baker, um, one of our professors and a, a, a noted uh, UAS expert on the use of drones in the Ukraine invasion. We read about that in the news about how uh, the Ukrainians are using uh, drones. Um, and Dr. Baker has been researching this and will be prepared to discuss it in the webinar. I think it'll be fascinating uh, glimpse into this new technology and how it's been used uh, in warfare. Uh, to learn more to, uh, about that webinar or to register for any of our webinars or to view webinars on demand, just go to this website, um, captechu.edu slash webinar hyphen series. There you'll find uh, the upcoming webinar in June and you'll have uh, ability to access all of our previous webinars that are now available on demand. Uh, speaking of that, I want to make sure that everybody who knows who registered for the session today will get a copy of the slides and a link to the recording. Uh, so watch for that email. When the email comes out, if you have um, viewed this session live or you're watching it on uh, demand and want a certificate of completion, all you need to do is respond to that email and I'll send, I'll prepare one and send it to you. Simply uh, wait until the email comes and we'll make sure that you get covered in that way. Now, I want to go on to our final slide, and I, as I do this, I see there's one more message, so let me get to that. Okay, that's uh, Camille says thanks, as does Roy. Uh, this does conclude today's webinar. I want to thank our presenter again. It's been really fascinating look into this, and as I mentioned in the email that went out prior to the session, whether you're a, a mentor or a mentee, I think you can benefit from this material, whether you're new in your career, whether you've been in your career for a long time, this has been excellent stuff that has really been helpful. This does conclude today's webinar. Look for that participation email and uh, a link to the recording and slides and a link to the upcoming webinar here in June. Thank you again to everyone who's joined us today and uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, let's see, uh, one, uh, George has a final comment. I'll read it here. Many of our uh, my jobs require a language or application aptitude that the organization had lost the last person trained in. That's very interesting comment, George, because that does happen. I've heard of that many times. How should one prepare for interviews that ask for a language or tool that is going to require special training? And, and of course, the underside of that would be, and no one has that ability to train you. Right. Right. Yeah. So the way that I look at this and George, I apologize if, if I'm looking at this the wrong way, but certainly with organizations that may have lost the person who was performing a specific role tends to be a little different from um, the, the person who was maybe the only person who was doing a, a specific thing. And the way that I differentiate between the two is there could be one person who was single threaded, uh, for example, supporting a mainframe, which believe it or not, still do exist in some organizations. That's a little different from a person uh, not being able to find a person that has experience in the way that those applications on the mainframe are written. Um, so if you, for example, have experience in COBOL, but you might not know that the way that COBOL is being used, you could certainly go in and uh, say that, okay, here's what I do to get up to speed on learning how to, this application works in your environment. Um, you could certainly uh, say you'd reach out to your network and as much as possible, reach out to other people who understand COBOL and um, different ways that it might be used for an organization that is within the same industry that the uh, one you're, in, you're interviewing with. So you could certainly say, I'd reach out to my network, but that's a little different from saying, okay, I don't know COBOL at all because you probably wouldn't be successful in getting that position. Um, so if you have the skill, just talk about what you would do to get up to speed quickly with how that skill is being used for the organization you're looking to join. 
That's a great answer. And um, it does remind me of that movie, which I, I think it was called Space Cowboys. I might not have that correct about um, the, the people that uh, the only ones that knew the language that NASA needed. So they had to be sent into outer space to fix the problem. Interesting <laughs> movie from a long time ago. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. I want to thank our presenter again. I want to thank everybody who's joined us. We are now are officially done and we are approaching the end of the hour. This has been a great session and uh, I hope all of you will have a great rest of the afternoon. So uh, with that, we will officially end, stop the recording and you may log off at any time. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Bernard, thank you again. I wanted to just uh, express my personal appreciation to this wonderful webinar. I've truly enjoyed it. And uh, I will uh, be um, sending you a follow-up a uh, little bit later this afternoon or first thing in the morning. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate you including me. Looking okay. forward to talking soon. Okay, you bet. Bye All now. Right, take care. Bye.